Hello and thank you so much for joining today's Acquisition Learning Seminar hosted by the Federal Acquisition Institute. Today's seminar, entitled Vendor Engagement and Negotiation, Meeting the Challenge of Better Outcomes, features a fantastic speaker from the Department of Agriculture. Improving acquisition outcomes is really what you're all about, but so many things play into it. Vendor engagement and negotiation skills are very good places to start as they should be emphasized and refreshed on a regular basis. Fortunately, you'll be introduced to collections of successful practices that will put you on a path towards unrelenting excellence. There are a couple of items I need to explain though before we get started. First, the Federal Acquisition Institute is recording this seminar. The video along with all of the material will be posted to the video library on FAI.gov in the coming weeks. Second, we will hold a live question and answer session at the end of today's seminar. If you have questions about vendor engagement, negotiating, or anything else you hear, submit those questions using the survey link on the screen. We will collect and consolidate them as you submit them, and then we'll take some time after the presentation to answer a few. With that, let's get started. Today's presenter, Al Munoz, is from the Department of Agriculture, and he'll take us through how you can engage with vendors throughout the acquisition process. Let's go to him now. Hello, and welcome to the Federal Acquisition Institute's latest acquisition learning seminar on vendor engagement and negotiation. I'm Al Munoz. I'm a project manager here in Washington, D.C. for the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, and over the last 20 years, I've been a contract specialist, a negotiator, a procurement analyst, and a contracting officer. Uh, and lately, my, my, uh, my duties include working on strategic sourcing and vendor engagement for the Department of Agriculture. Uh, today, we'll, we'll go through my presentation on vendor engagement. We'll talk about negotiation skills a little bit uh, for about an hour, and then we'll take a break, uh, during which time we'll, we'll take a look at the questions you submitted during the presentation and then we'll come back and we'll answer those questions for you. On the right side of your screen, you'll see a button uh, to submit a question. So anytime during the presentation, if you have a question about something I've said or about any of the topics that we're talking about today, um, go ahead and hit that button and submit a question there. We'll be able to see that during the presentation and we'll read them during the break, and then we'll, we'll come back and we'll answer them for you. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about today is uh, something that uh, has been a topic of of much interest over the last few years in, in federal acquisition, and that's the topic of vendor engagement. Uh, and what we'll talk about is the existing Mythbusters campaign that was started by the Office of Federal Procurement Policy a few years ago. And we'll talk about uh, agency vendor communication plans and other areas where you can find information about how to do more vendor engagement within your agency. We'll talk a little bit about the most pervasive misconceptions that still exist out there. And then we'll, we'll transition into how better and better engagement can lead to better negotiation for you. And then we'll talk more specifically about some tools and techniques that, for better negotiations that we know about from our experience in, in federal acquisition. We'll take a break at that point, and then we'll get into the question and answer session. So let's talk about vendor engagement a little bit. Uh, as I was saying, the Office of Federal Procurement Policy started a Mythbusters campaign a few years ago. Um, it specifically, on February 2nd, 2011, they, they issued the first myth-busting memo, addressing misconceptions to improve communication with industry during the acquisition process. Now, this memo talks specifically about agency program managers and contracting officers and others with roles in acquisition about what specifically they could help do with vendor engagement. Uh, for agency program managers, vendor engagement helps them to define requirements and for those on the contracting side, it helps to develop acquisition strategies when seeking opportunities for small business and for when negotiating contract terms. Access to current market information is absolutely critical. Now, here are some sources for uh, more information about engaging with your vendors. Um, specifically, your, your industry partners, those that you're doing business with, that you're writing contracts with, uh, they're the best source of information about the market, about current technology, and about trends that are, that are going to affect your future procurements. Now, there's no way that you could be on, on our side, on the government side, and know as much about the market, about the competition, 
about any changes in technology as your industry partners are going to be. Now they're more than willing to give this information to you if you take the time to give them that opportunity and take the time to listen to them when they come to you with information. Now I know that a lot of industry partners will reach out to you and they'll solicit you, they'll give you their marketing materials, they'll want to come and have a conversation with you, and I know you're busy. Um, so it, it behooves you to take the time to find out when uh, and those opportunities are for engaging with your vendors. Any, any type of outreach events that maybe your Ostabu office is doing uh, or other opportunities where you can take a break from your desk, interact with your, your vendors in a meaningful way, and get some information about what's going on out there in the marketplace. The other place that I'm going to direct you are the agency vendor communication plans. Now, each one of the 24 CFO Act agencies, which are essentially the largest um, executive branch agencies that are out there, Department of Agriculture, for example, and GSA, um, they have all posted to their agency websites, they've, they've developed and posted these to their websites, their agency vendor communication plans. Now, these are specific to your agency. They all right, so agency vendor communication plans, they provide clear and consistent direction to the workforce and criteria for identifying which acquisitions must include vendor input in the pre-award phase. Now, these are rich documents filled with a lot of information specific to the agency that you're working in. And they talk to you directly in the workforce about where you should look for opportunities to include vendor engagement in your acquisitions. Now, productive interactions between industry and agency officials are important so that you and the government side clearly understand the marketplace and that you can award a contract or order for an effective solution at a reasonable price. Now, vendor engagement. I understand also because that you're because you're busy that it's not always easy to get out there and have some type of vendor engagement activity all the time, and there certainly isn't a need to engage with industry on absolutely everything that you're buying. Certainly, if you're buying simple things like office supplies, staplers, pens, pencils, you don't need to in engage with industry to find out what the latest technology is in order to make a good deal. Um, those things are easy to understand. Your customer probably isn't all that interested in the latest greatest type of pencil that's out there. Um, so you can go out there and just go ahead and make your purchase without doing too much engagement with industry. When it comes to things that are more complex, uh, if you're doing things like buying rocket ships or building buildings uh, or doing something that's cutting edge in IT, you need to be out there talking to the vendor community and you should be encouraging your customers and the end users of the technology that you're going to be buying to get out there to understand what's available in the marketplace, to understand if there are any innovations that are coming that will you know, be disruptive to what you're used to buying or anything that's going to be affecting what, what is available for you so that you can make the best deal possible. And vendor engagement is especially important for complex and high-risk procurements where it makes sense to take your time, get as much information as you possibly can about the industry, about what's going on, and meet with your customer so that everyone has an understanding on the government side of what the best possible bargain you can make is. Now, OFPP continued the conversation with another memo that they issued on May 7, 2012, called Myth Busting 2, Addressing Misconceptions and Further Improving Communication During the Acquisition Process. Now, the second iteration of Myth Busters focused on industry misconceptions, where the first memo was focused specifically at the acquisition workforce and uh, the challenges and opportunities there and the misconceptions that many in the acquisition workforce have. Uh, this one focused specific, specifically on industry misconceptions. Industry, not surprisingly, uh, has a tough time sometimes understanding the government's procurement process. It's a complex thing. The FAR is a, is a large document with lots of twists and turns to it, and it's impossible to memorize all of that stuff. And for industry, trying to understand, you know, both how all of that operates and what people on the, on the uh, government side are doing to uh, implement that regulation is very tough. It's, it's a complex environment for them as well. Um, so there are some misconceptions based on their observations that had cropped up, and that's what uh, OFPP was trying to dispel with the second version of MythBusters. Now, the key takeaway from... The MythBusters campaign to date from both of these memos from the agency um, vendor communication plans is just to simply stop buying from strangers. Um, it's easy for um, those of us on the government side to continue to just move the paper from, from one end to the other of the acquisition process. 
we have a requisition that's coming in. Someone somewhere in our agency needs to buy something in order to deliver their products and services to, to the public. Um, so it's easy for us to get caught up in just moving things through the complicated process, get to the end, to make a purchase, and be done with it at the end of the day so that we can pick up the next requisition that's already waiting for us by the time we're halfway through. Um, but not getting that information from industry, not understanding your vendors, not understanding what's going on in their environment, not, a, not understanding what's going on with the technology, if there are things that are changing out there, um, it's really a disservice to your customers by simply blindly moving from one point to another. And I know that there's a competitive process involved, and I know that there's a selection process involved, uh, but that, that selection process by itself won't give you the type of information about the market. It won't give you the type of information about the type of responses that you can expect um, without going out and getting more information from industry. So I'm going to ask you to take a look at your existing processes and take a look at what you've been doing and, and maybe expand what you've been doing with vendor engagement a little bit. And the first thing I'd like to ask you is, are you still buying from strangers? Now, all of you on the contracting side, you have a business background, so you understand marketing. You understand uh, business operations to a certain degree. You understand uh, a lot about business that maybe you haven't had the opportunity to employ yet in your work. But I'm going to ask you to, to recall that business background and to ask some questions when you're doing your procurements to find out if maybe there are some things about the, the process that you're going through right now where some improvements can be made. Now these types of questions that I presented here, now these are some basic questions. These are some things that you probably remember from going through uh, business classes that are really es essential to getting to understand the marketplace, essential to starting a business, uh, essential to running a business that you, you probably remember hearing about. Um, if you have these questions, if you start to ask these types of questions and you take an interest in the types of things that you're buying, I think these will lead to some more questions for your particular procurements that will expand your knowledge base and give you a better picture of the markets in which you're operating. Um, how well do you know the vendors that you buy from? Now, that's an interesting question because some, uh, some of these vendors get in for, for quite a long time. If you have a five-year contract, for example, you know, that, that vendor's been around for a while when it comes time to recompete. So it's, it's kind of an odd question to be asked, how well do you know that vendor? Well, I've, I've known them for five years. Um, but how well do you know them really? What's, what's really going on in their environment that you haven't had a conversation with them about yet uh, to find out if there's any new technologies that are coming out, any innovations? Is there, is there anything going on with the market that that vendor has been operating in that really is going to have an impact on how you're going to put together your next contract? Is that vendor large or small? Uh, were they small when they got the award and they're large now? What about the competition that you're expecting for your next procurement? Are they large or small? Um, how long have they been in business? How mature is the industry? If you're talking about something uh, like office supplies or construction, maybe the, maybe the industry is fairly mature, although I'll argue that construction changes fairly rapidly. Um, but for new technologies, even for something as simple as uh, you know, laptops and desktops, uh, telephone systems, you know, those things change all the time. So even though your vendors have been around for a while, maybe the industry really isn't that mature. Maybe there's a lot of changes going on. Maybe there's some disruptive technologies that are out there that are going to make an impact on what your agency is able to get in its next solicitation um, to you know, effectively prosecute its mission. How dense or competitive is the industry? Now, competition in the industry makes a huge amount of difference. If there are a few large vendors dominating a market, um, you can expect competition to go a certain way. But if it's highly competitive, if there's many uh, participants in that particular market, um, maybe your approach should be just a little bit different. And when you start looking into that, I think you'll understand when you look at the market in which you're, you're trying to procure, the composition that's out there in the marketplace today is going to make a huge difference in the amount of competition that you're naturally going to get as a response to your solicitation. I would also ask how well you know the products and services that you buy. Um, some things, like I said, are easy to understand. Staplers do pretty much what they've done since we were kids. Um, they staple some pieces of paper together. There's not much there. I think everybody really understands from the beginning to end what it's going to do. Expectations are, are pretty easy to manage. Um, but what about other things that you're, you're purchasing today? Do you really understand what's going on with those things? 
I can speak from experience and I can say that I've bought many things that I didn't really understand what they did. And in a lot of cases, I didn't even know what they looked like. And that, that's unfortunately the nature of the acquisition process today, especially as things get more and more automated. You know, the documents don't even get handed to you anymore. They come over your email or your computer system, and there may or may not be a, a very good explanation of what it is that you're, you're being asked to purchase. But I ask you to take a minute, and if you see something that's come across your desk for purchase and you don't really understand what it is or you haven't seen one in a long time, you know, pull it up on the Internet, take a look at it, and see if you understand it, see if it makes sense to you, and see if anything in what you're seeing out there makes you wonder a little bit more about it, gets you curious about what it is that you're buying. And I can assure you that the more you understand the things that you're buying, the better purchases you're going to make. Um, and again, what the market is like, you know, if the market is highly competitive, it may not be particularly profitable for the vendors that are in there. That might not make a, an immediate impact on your solicitation, but when it comes time to negotiate with those vendors later on, if they're in an industry where the margins are very, very thin and it's highly competitive, you might not be able to expect to get that 50% discount you can if you're buying something off of schedule or you're buying something from a, a, an industry where you have a, a very profitable business model out there. So take a look at those, ask those types of questions, and see if they lead to some more questions about the products and services that you buy, about the vendors that you're interacting with, and about the markets in which you want to do business. I would say that it, it really makes a lot of sense for you, and, and, and now I'm talking to everyone, the program managers, the end users, the contracting officers, to analyze the sector that you're doing business in commensurate with the level of complexity and risk inherent in the products and services you buy. Um, of course, something that's riskier, if it, if it has a, a higher degree of development, for example, uh, or if it's extremely complex and very difficult for everyone to understand, uh, it's going to take more analysis. It's going to take uh, more time and more skill to examine the market to see what's out there and to see what impact on your solicitations anything that's going on in the market or anything that's going on with technology you're going to have. Now let's talk about the most pervasive misconceptions. Uh, so our colleagues over at ACT-IAC uh, did a survey about a year, year and a half after the initial Mythbusters memo came out. And that survey went out to a, a large number of industry and it went out to a large number of, of government respondents as well. And what they came up with was a list of misconceptions that were, that were still out there that still needed to be debunked. And part of that survey um, looked at the existing myths and which ones of those seemed to be the most pervasive, which ones that, that seemed to be the ones that clung on the, the most severely. Uh, and we'll talk about those two misconceptions right now. The first is that the government can't meet one-on-one -on -one with a potential offer. And the other one is that a protest is something to be avoided at all costs, even if it means the government limits conversations with industry. Let's take this uh, first one first, the can't meet one-on-one -on -one with a potential offer. Now, generally, there is no such prohibition. Um, Any time prior to solicitation, anyone on the government side, from program managers, end users, uh, the person down the hall who, uh, who's going to use the product at some point in the future, uh, all of those people are able to meet one-on-one -on -one with a vendor. Uh, if you check the FAR, FAR 15, it actually encourages these types of interactions, and there is no prohibition that you'll find anywhere in any of the regulations that says absolutely you cannot meet one-on-one -on -one with a vendor. You can. Um, there are some rules, uh, and there are some parameters under which you can do that, and we'll talk about a few of them here today. Um, but I would encourage you uh, to meet one-on-one -on -one with the vendors, and the reason for that is that when you, you limit yourself to just meeting with vendors in groups at uh, industry days or other types of events like that, you know, the vendors, not surprisingly, uh, don't want to speak in front of each other about anything that they might consider proprietary or a trade secret or something that's giving them a competitive advantage. Uh, but they absolutely do have information about the market. They do have information about the technology. And they're willing to share that with the government if it means that together you can find a better solution. Now, I know that there is a, a healthy um, suspicion of industry, I think, at times, based on you know, the competitive model and the fact that they're out to make a profit. Um, but really, the vendors want to do a good job, too, because their existence depends in a large part on the amount of business that they're able to, to continually have. So it's, it's not just a matter of getting this contract. It's a matter of, of their livelihood for the next you know, foreseeable future 
uh, and keeping them in business for a long period of time. So they don't want to um, destroy their relationship with you by keeping secrets from you if it means that you're going to get a better product at the end of the day. Now, communication obviously is more restricted during the solicitation, uh, during which time the contracting officer is going to be the focal point and ends with receipt of proposals. And of course, anytime you have information directly affecting proposal preparation, it must be shared with all potential offerers. Keep it fair and be ethical in your engagement. Now, the thing that you have to watch out for on the government side is that your customer, your program office, doesn't become enamored of one or a minority set of vendors. That leads to some bad outcomes, and it can direct your solicitation in a way uh, that it creates a barrier to entry for you know, some technologies or some vendors that might have a better solution for you uh, if you write your solicitation in a particularly restrictive way. So you have to be careful for that. And in contracting officers, this is something that you're monitoring already, and I would just encourage you to continue doing that. Um, but I'm also going to say that as you go down this journey of increased vendor engagement, you're going to see some mistakes. Um, people are going to have conversations that uh, may be you know, bordering on the line between uh, what, what's possible and what shouldn't really be done. Uh, people are going to cross that line from time to time. There are going to be some things that, that happen. People are going to make mistakes. Um, I, would, I would tell you that in regard to those mistakes, good judgment is going to come from experience, but experience comes from bad judgment. So those mistakes, even though they're troublesome at the time, overall they're going to lead to having a better understanding of what vendor engagement is actually the best type of vendor engagement where things are moving, progressing toward better outcomes for you and your agency, and when they may cross the line and, and create an additional headache for the acquisition staff or for the agency that's looking to purchase something. Um, but over time, as you get used to that and as these mistakes get worked out, you're going to find that your outcomes are going to improve dramatically. Let's talk about this second misconception that seems to be hanging around also. Uh, that a protest is something to be avoided at all costs, even if it means the government limits conversation with industry. Now, I can speak from my own experience that I've heard this one quite a bit. Um, just being in an operational contracting office putting together solicitations and having that those conversations about, well, if we do this, we'll get a protest. Or if we answer this question, we'll get a protest. If we answer this email, we'll get a protest. Um, protests aren't really all that frequent. Um, they are something that is a check and balance on the system. So they're, they're, they do take more time. Uh, it's something that's going to cost you some paperwork. It's going to cost you some time. You're going to it's going to delay your solicitation by some time. Uh, but at the end of the day, the protest process really is designed to keep everything above board. Uh, having someone come in and take a look at your process, right, wrong, or indifferent, is not really a negative thing other than the time, uh, obviously, that it's going to take to deal with the protest. Um, but like I was saying, protests are still quite rare. Um, statistics around protests is that I think it's something like 0.02% of all acquisitions get protested. And of those protests, there's, there's less than a 20% chance that the vendor that's, that's filed the protest is actually going to be successful. Um, the rest of the time, uh, solicitations go just fine. Uh, the level of engagement has, has been effective to the, to the point that protest wasn't filed. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, when that protest was lost, it was over something that legitimately the government probably should have paid just a little bit more attention to. Now, I know that it's going to take some time, and I know that, that there is still a healthy fear of protests out there, uh, but realistically, um, you're, you're going to stand a much better chance of defending against a protest if you have you know, good documentation, and if you've had that level of engagement, which we'll talk about here in a second, with your vendor so that the vendor clearly understands what the government has done and that everything has been fair and above board so that a, a protest is far less likely. I want to ask you also, when you look at a protest, what are you thinking about? Uh, if someone has protested your solicitation or someone has protested your award decision, what is it exactly that they're seeking? Now, I know that there's a lot of thought that a protest is really just a, an upset vendor um, firing their last torpedo at you in some effort to um, disrupt or delay what it is that you're trying to do. But, but why is that vendor really protesting? And 
what is a protest really? Um, other than a vendor who's just saying, you know, I really haven't had the amount of engagement that I could use in order to understand the government's process, understand the government's decision, so that I, I know what to do next time. I know what I did wrong. I know how I was beaten, if I was beaten, and what I can do to improve my chances the next time I, I answer a solicitation. A protest really signifies that a vendor wants answers from you. They're not getting them, and one of their only recourses is to file a protest. And unfortunately, a lot of protests go down that road. Vendors are saying, you know, we think there's something that's gone wrong in government. You really haven't answered our, our questions about this particular part of your process. A much better option in this is to just have a debriefing. Uh, and I would encourage you to have debriefings even with your winning proposal. Um, a debriefing gives you an opportunity to have a discussion with the vendors that have submitted responses in, to your solicitation and talk about what they, where they went wrong, if they went wrong, and what they can do better next time. Now, the protest process itself is not really designed to give them those answers. It's really more of a, a look at what the government has done to make sure that everything was fair and balanced. It's really not going to give the vendor any more information about how to do better next time, but a debrief is, and that's exactly what a debrief is designed to do. Here's what's gone wrong. Here is you know, our interpretation of what we've seen in front of us in this particular solicitation. And let us help you understand what went wrong this time and what you can do better next time. And even for winning proposals, you know, that vendor is going to be submitting responses to future solicitations. And even though they've won this round, it, it's going to behoove you and them to give them information on how to do better next time so that everybody improves in the process. Thorough debriefs, I'm going to tell you, lead to better future proposals, and I'll be honest with you, in the times where we've had debriefs, in my experience, we've had a lot fewer protests. In those times, and I'll be honest with you as well, where we haven't done a very good job of doing debriefs, the process was much more arbitrary, the, the, the argumentative rather, and we saw a lot more protests as a result. Now I want to leave you with this thought about vendor engagement before we move into negotiation. Government contracting of the future will be about interacting with industry more meaningfully and about designing effective solutions together, not about buying from strangers. So now I'm going to talk about negotiation a little bit. And I want to show how, you know, I'm going to give you some tools and tips of, of negotiation that have come out of uh, years of experience. But I'm also going to talk about how better vendor engagement could lead to better outcomes in your negotiations as well. Vendor engagement gives you an opportunity to know the vendor. If you've ever gone in to buy something large if you, on, on a personal basis, if you've gone in to buy a refrigerator, you've gone in to buy a car, um, you know that you don't know much about that, that vendor specifically. You don't know a whole lot about what's going on for that vendor. Um, but it would make a lot more sense for you, and I think it would ease your, your purchase if you knew more about that vendor, you knew more about what was going on with that vendor's industry, if you knew, for example, that the refrigerator you're looking for is maybe last year's model and you're, there are deep discounts around, uh, that would make a lot more uh, help for you when you go in to make a bargain over that particular refrigerator or car. You know the product and service. Again, just as I was saying, if you know, for example, that last year's model is on sale or a new model is about to come out, you know that you're going to be able to negotiate a better deal with that model that you're looking for. Or maybe it's time to wait. Whichever, but you'll know the product or service that you're, that you're going to buy, and you have a better opportunity at that point to bargain over, you need to have a more effective bargain at that point. And finally, know the environment in which you are engaged. Again, if there's a lot of competition, that's going to mean one thing for your vendor engagement and your negotiation techniques, and it's going to mean something else altogether if you're dealing with a, a few large vendors, perhaps, or maybe even one vendor, and they're the only ones that provide that product or service, and it's the only place that you're going to get it. That's going to make a, a huge amount of difference in your approach. It's going to make a huge amount of difference in the bargain that you can expect, and it's going to make a huge amount of difference in how long it's going to take you to reach that bargain. Without these, I'll be honest with you, your negotiations are going to be a lot more difficult. If you go in blind, just like anything else, you would never go into a car dealer and uh, just pick something off the lot and say, hey, give me the best price on this. You, know, you may or may not get the best price. 
Uh, but if, you're, if you go in armed with this information, if you go in armed with this background knowledge about the vendor, about the product or service that it is that you want to buy and the environment that that vendor is operating in, you're going to have a much better, a much better negotiation. You're going to have a much better outcome at the end of the day. Now, a negotiation, just on a very basic level, is a discussion aimed at reaching an agreement. Uh, as a process, negotiation is communication through which two parties attempt to reach a mutually satisfact satisfactory result on a matter of common concern. That's kind of textbook and it kind of um, maybe normative perhaps in what a negotiation actually is. But I think if you think about it a little bit, um, really at the end of the day, at the end of that negotiation, what you want is a mutually satisfactory result. You don't want anybody walking away from the table that is unhappy with what's happened at the negotiation table. You don't want to have the vendor walk away um, having cut their price below a sustainable price, uh, knowing that they're going to lose money on this and now looking for ways to make it up elsewhere. Uh, but you also don't want the government walking away with a, with a horrible bargain uh, and perhaps finding out later that you paid far too much money for something or you, you, you paid the right amount of money for the wrong product or service. Now, I know that a lot of people, when they first get into negotiation, start talking about it in terms of winning and losing, uh, as if uh, going to the negotiation was some type of contest or a game, uh, and there's going to be a winner, there's going to be a loser, and if you're going to be on a, on a, in a win-lose situation, of course, everybody wants to be on the win side. And that's really not the case. Uh, negotiation is not a game or a contest. Remember, we're looking for a mutually satisfactory result. There are no players and there are no sides and, and no one really wins a negotiation unless everybody wins in the negotiation. A successful negotiation is one in which the parties achieved, again, a mutually satisfactory result. Thinking of negotiations as a contest is really detrimental to the goal of achieving better outcomes. And now I've seen you know, newer 1102s or, or newer program staff that are going into their very first negotiations and they're reluctant to do so because they're afraid they're going to lose. Um, that causes a whole lot of reluctance not only to get into the process, but it causes a whole lot of reluctance to actually get in and get into the details that you're going to need to get into for a particular negotiation. Um, it also allows for bad outcomes. Uh, I've seen folks come out of negotiations declaring victory, giving the high five, saying, wow, we really got you know, the, the best bargain possible, uh, and finding out later on that, yeah, you won because the vendor actually knew that you were going to make it a contest, and they gave you what you were looking for, the win. And what really happened is somewhere behind the scenes, they've already made allowances for that and brought to the table only those things that would make you think you won. I've seen that happen dozens of times over a career, and it, it, it takes some time. It takes some experience. You have to get in there and do the negotiations over and over again. But if you're up front with the contractor, if you're up front with your vendor, uh, you're, gonna, you're prepared to be reasonable. They'll be prepared to be reasonable. If you're prepared to be unreasonable, unfortunately, you're taking your chances on whether or not you're, you're going to come out of there knowing that you've gotten a good deal or just guessing that you got a good deal and high-fiving your, your, your pals when you get back to your desk. Now let's talk about what happens when somebody loses a negotiation. What do you suppose a vendor would do in the case it went into the negotiation room and came out agreeing to a price that it could not pay, or it could not do the work for? Uh, what's going to happen? Well, I can assure you that that's not going to happen. The, the vendor is going to come out of that negotiation uh, if they've been forced to agree to a price that they can't possibly perform for, uh, it, something's going to suffer. Uh, either the employees are going to suffer, um, the quality is going to suffer, timeliness is going to suffer. Uh, if you force the vendor into that corner, if you've made them uh, agree to something that they can't possibly do, you're going to end up finding out that later on um, something else is, is going to be more difficult. And unfortunately, that's quality in a lot of cases. But in some cases, it just means that your next negotiation isn't going to be a negotiation. It's going to be a shouting match because your vendor is going to dig their heels in trying to make up what they just lost in the last negotiation. Um, it, worst case scenario, your vendor is simply not going to perform. Uh, if the vendor agrees to a price at the negotiation table that's just completely unsustainable, they just absolutely cannot make it up, they, 
they absolutely can't pay their bills because um, they've agreed to a price that they 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 just can't support. Uh, you know, worst case scenario, and I've seen this happen as well. The vendor comes back and says, "I'm sorry, it, it's just not going to happen." Uh, and that's a tough sell back to your agency and back to your mission area. That you know, we we had this great deal, we declared victory, we were high fiving you a few minutes ago, but now the vendor's coming back and saying, "I'm sorry, we're just not going to deliver." You know, going into a negotiation, obviously the government has a superior bargaining position. The government has all the money. Uh, the government has the, the need, uh, and the government has the ability to reach out and go to any vendor that it wants to. And in that regard, the government's in a superior bargaining position, and that can force some bad outcomes. The example I was giving a little while ago where the, the contracting staff comes out of the negotiation table happy that they've gotten a price that you know, isn't reasonable, but the, the vendor agreed to it anyways, you know, that's, a, that's a reflection of the, of the government's superior bargaining position. Uh, if you go into a, a negotiation with the vendor and you put your fist down, you say, I'm absolutely not going over this price, take it or leave it, we'll find somebody else, you know, the vendor's going to do their best to, to keep your business. Um, but that's going to cause a problem later on down the road, like I was just saying. Leveraging that superior bargaining position to the detriment of the vendor is going to result in bad outcomes. You're going to get poorer quality, the employees are going to suffer, I've seen safety go out the window. Um, all kinds of negative outcomes can, can come out as a result of trying to win a negotiation. It's not worth it. You know, realistically, what you want are long-term relationships with your vendors that are beneficial for everyone. If you've stuck it to a vendor at a negotiation table, if they're out on a job site or they're out working in your spaces and they see something that's going to cost you money, you know, they might be reluctant at that point to say, hey, you know, you could save some money by doing this. They might keep that to themselves and say, well, you know, we got a great bargain. We're not going to even bother telling the government that uh, what we agreed to uh, is actually only going to cost us about a third of what we told them it was going to be. Now, that's probably a worst case scenario, uh, but those types of situations come up. Uh, because in contrast, the vendor has superior knowledge. The vendor knows what their employees are going to cost. They know how efficient they are. They know how productive they are. They know what their products and services cost. They know if they're going to be able to negotiate with their uh, second-tier subcontractors, perhaps, um, to get uh, the rates they need in order to sustain their business model. So they may not necessarily be passing on any discounts or changes in technology that are lowering their costs onto you, especially if they know that you're just going to take advantage of them when it comes time to actually entering into negotiations over whatever product or service it is that you need to buy next. If you're being unreasonable, you can't expect your vendor to be cooperative with you. You can't expect your vendor to be forthcoming with you when changes come up that are going to reduce their costs. You just can't expect it. Maybe you think you can. Maybe you think you understand the industry well enough that you'll see these things coming. I assure you, you have absolutely not the same amount of information that a vendor does when that vendor is out there and their day-to-day -day livelihood depends on their ability to run their business. They are going to always know more than you know about the products and services, about the industry, about the competition, what discounts they can get. They're always going to know more. And if you're reasonable, they'll help and pass that information on to you. And if you're unreasonable, they're going to try to take advantage of you just like you're trying to take advantage of them. Now let's talk about something where this has gone horribly wrong. Let's talk about a negotiation that happened where all of this came into play, where you had an unreasonable buyer, you had a vendor doing their best to meet that buyer's demands, to maintain that relationship, and everything went absolutely wrong. Let's talk about the 30 pence gourmet burger. Uh, as you recall, about a year, year and a half ago, uh, over in the United Kingdom, uh, there were some problems with hamburger meat that was showing up on the market and on people's tables that was made from something other than cow. Um, looking at that, if you read the report that came out of the, the UK government about that situation, you'll see that very early on in that entire uh, situation, there was an unreasonable buyer who demanded that a burger patty be produced, uh, a gourmet burger patty be produced, for 30 pence. Now, if that buyer had taken the time to understand the market, when you look at the report, you'll find out that a gourmet burger of the caliber that that buyer was looking for was reasonably available for about 69 pence. 
So when that vendor put together that 30 pence burger for that buyer who was, you know, back in the office, high-fiving, declaring victory over what they, you know, a, a great deal that they'd struck at the bargaining table, what ended up showing up in the supermarket was hamburger that had something in it other than cow. Um, now, the result of all of that, as, as disgusting as that was in and of itself, um, the result of all of that, trying to repair that damage, the company that that buyer worked for, the, the damage repair far exceeded any profit that could have been made from the 30 pence burger. So this is something where, you know, uh, being unreasonable with the vendor, forcing the vendor to, uh, to come to your terms, using, leveraging your superior uh, bargaining power in order to force the vendor into a situation that's not sustainable, resulted in not only embarrassment, but some pretty disgusting hamburgers. So let's talk about planning for negotiations. Now, anyone that's involved in the acquisition process, you're going to negotiate at some point with your vendors. I know a lot of people in the process right now, they're buying things like office supplies or you're just coming up in your career and you haven't yet got into the more complex things. You haven't yet got into the types of procurements where you you're, have it, an opportunity to negotiate, uh, but you're going to negotiate at some point. Um, so. I would say be prepared to negotiate on every acquisition, even the simple ones, even the ones where you think nothing's going to go wrong. I can tell you from experience, some of my simplest contracts, the ones that seem to be going the smoothest, the ones that had the lowest dollar value and the least complexity, uh, have jumped up and bitten me and been some of the most complica complicated negotiations that I've been in in my life. I want to point out to you also that you probably negotiated at some point today. If you have children, young children in particular, you know that you've gone through a process this morning to get their shoes on, to get them dressed, to get them out the door on time. And that process really is you going through a negotiation with that child. The child wants one thing, you want another thing, uh, but at the end of the day, everybody comes together. That's a mutually satisfactory result. There might be some hurt feelings there. You can't expect a child to always be reasonable. But at the end of the day, everyone's happy because everything went smoothly and everyone got what they needed in order to move on with their next step. I'll point out also that this happens quite frequently during the day, uh, two people trying to get on an elevator. You might not even talk, but you're going to have this negotiation. There are two people, there are one door, one of you is going to go first. How do you make that decision? You negotiate. You may have in your mind, for example, that your position is, I'm fine with get anybody else going in front of me as long as I get on the elevator. The other person might have the exact same attitude, or they might have the other attitude that, well, I'm just going to go first because I'm closest to the opening or whatever's in their mind. But at the end of the day, you're both just trying to get on the elevator to go to another floor, and you work that out between you often in silence. That's a negotiation. So when you're thinking about getting into negotiations for the first time, that's really all it is. You're looking for a mutually satisfactory result, in this case, getting the kids out the door on time or both getting on the elevator to go to another floor. And at the end of the day, you've come to that mutually satisfactory result. Everybody's gone on their way. And it really wasn't all that difficult to process. Now, the objective of negotiations in the government is to get the right price for the level of quality and delivery that the government requires. Again, not to get the lowest price. Uh, in some cases, you're going to want to pay a higher price because you want a higher level of quality. You want something that's uh, more rugged, perhaps, if you're buying some type of hardware. Uh, you want something that's going to last longer. Maybe you want something that's going to be more expensive on the front end, uh, but it's going to be less maintenance cost. Well, that's really what negotiation is all about. It's making those choices, and it's having that discussion with the vendor so that you strike the right balance between what it is that the government needs, meeting its future needs, uh, but also meeting its budget constraints. And at the end of the day, I know that there's been a lot of discussion about the budget and getting the lowest possible price for things, but really when you go into negotiations, lowest price is only one of your concerns. You want to pay the right price for what it is that your agency needs in order to fulfill its mission. Now, the FAR itself discusses negotiation uh, in terms of developing a pre-negotiation position. And 
uh, also in developing pre-negotiation objectives somewhat interchangeably. Now, a position gives the impression that this is my place. This is the thing that I'm bringing to the table, and I can only be bumped off of this by someone convincing me that my position is incorrect. Now, that's not quite right. Um, when you come to the negotiation table, what you're really trying to get is not so much what you've decided your position is going to be as your objective of walking away from the table with having something at the right price. A position has a static connotation, uh, suggesting you know, that the vendor has to come to the table and convince you that you're wrong in order for um, you to come away with some type of an agreement. And that's not really how it should work. Uh, you're both trying to get something, obviously. The vendor is trying to get paid. The vendor is trying to get some additional work from you. You're trying to get the best possible bargain for your agency. Um, but have that in mind. Have that objective in the mind. Getting the best possible bargain for your agency. Not getting exactly what you think you're going to get when you go in. Not getting exactly the price. Maybe not even getting exactly the product that you were trying to get when you went into that negotiation. You really want to meet the objective of your requirement. So if your requirement, for example, is to get uh, a wall built or a, a wall painted, for example, at the end of the day, that's really what you're looking for. Now, you may have done your research and you know exactly what, what it's going to cost to build that wall, to paint that wall. You know how high it's going to be. You maybe you've even called around to a few suppliers and gotten some prices. But at the end of the day, what you really want is to learn from the vendor what it's bringing to the table, maybe even pointing out that you've done some market research on your own, and maybe the vendor's not even in the right pace. Maybe the vendor hasn't even considered the suppliers that you've considered. So that's the type of back and forth exchange that needs to take place so that when you walk away from the table, you've met your objective. The wall is going up, it's going to be painted. Maybe it's not even the, the same type of paint, maybe it's not even the same height of wall. There are all types of uh, flexibilities uh, and possibilities that come out of a negotiation the end of the day, you're going to get a painted wall. And that's really what you're looking for. Your objective shouldn't be, I want a painted wall at the lowest possible price, uh, and that's my position, and somebody's got to convince me otherwise, or I'm just going to put my feet down, dig my heels in, and, and uh, require the vendor to, to come to me, for example. Um, that's not necessary. At the end of the day, you know, be reasonable. Have the objective in mind that you want to get your mission accomplished, and your negotiation is going to go a lot more smooth. Having that adversarial um, position when you first come into a negotiation, you know, it really distracts from meeting that objective. You get into a discussion over pricing, over suppliers, over profit margins. You know, you, you start having a discussion about everything except for the wall, and really that's not the objective. So what I would encourage you to do is be open about what your objective is. Be willing to share information that you've gathered when you've done your research coming to this negotiation and at the end of the day, come out of there with a mutually satisfactory result. Identifying those mutual interests around which the government and its industry partners can bargain, uh, I'll be honest with you, can achieve a much more mutually satisfactory result than going in and trying to duke it out with someone. Remember, the point of negotiations is to achieve that mutually satisfactory result. Don't become overly focused on achieving the lowest possible price. And remember that the lowest price can really cost you. Now let's go over some tools for effective negotiation. Um, preparation, obviously you're going to do your homework before you go into negotiation. Just like going on to that car lot to buy a car, you're not just going to say, hey, you tell me what I need. You know, that's just not a possibility and it's not a, not a very good way of, of picking out a new car. Um, do your homework just like that situation. Uh, take ownership of what it is that you're trying to get and um, prepare to um, have that discussion with the vendor. Maybe even point out some information that they didn't know. Maybe accept that some things are going to happen at the negotiation table that you hadn't prepared for, and be flexible and be ready for that. Focus on your objectives, and remember that your objective is to get out of there with a mutually satisfactory result, to get what it is that your agency needs to meet its mission, and not to duke it out or win the negotiation or get the lowest possible price. Remember, be flexible. Now, going back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier about effective vendor engagement, 
go through the process of effective vendor engagement. Go through the process of understanding your vendor, having that discussion with them, having that open dialogue back and forth with them uh, to understand them and to understand the environment in which they're operating. Thoroughly document with your customer the government's requirement and do your homework on what its fair price is. Remember that a fair and reasonable price isn't a number, it's range, and that range depends on the things that you need within your requirement and the things that you'd like to have in your requirement. The level of quality, the sustainability, maintenance costs down the road, other things like that are probably negotiable. But find that out with a thorough dialogue with your customer first. Understand the objectives of the negotiation and be able to distinguish those objectives that we were just talking about that must be met from those that can be reduced if needed. And don't be tied to that position. Understand the limit of your own infallibility. Uh, I can't even tell you the number of times that I've gone into a negotiation and the conversation went in a completely new direction uh, that I hadn't anticipated despite the amount of preparation that I had done and I came out with some type of surprise bargain or maybe had to just stop the negotiation and go back and do a little bit more homework. Those are humbling experiences and what they've taught me is that anything can happen in negotiation and despite the amount of preparation that I've done, despite how thorough a job I think I've done or how experienced I am, just about anything can happen in there and I may not always be right. Um, being reasonable about that, being understanding about that, being self-aware enough to accept that you're not infallible will help with your negotiations. Your vendors will see that you're willing to be reasonable and they'll be willing to be reasonable in return. Be prepared, but be prepared for change. And remember, the end of the day, there's more than one way to make a burger. The last thought that I'll leave you with today is remember that you and your team will make mistakes along the way. Remember that those mistakes, that bad judgment, are what's going to build up your experience. And quite honestly, we could use more small mistakes to build upon our experience so that we'll make fewer large mistakes in the future. Well, thank you for listening to my presentation today. We're going to pause for a few minutes and then we'll get right back with you, during which time we'll read the questions that you've submitted, and we'll start to answer those. That was an amazing overview of how you can engage with vendors for improved acquisition outcomes. We hope you found today's presentation extremely valuable and useful. If you didn't before we began, I bet you now see how easy it is to engage with vendors throughout the acquisition process. Now don't go anywhere. We've been collecting and consolidating the questions that you've submitted. After a brief five minute break, we'll be back to answer a few of them. We'll be back in five. Welcome back to the Acquisition Learning Seminar on Vendor Engagement and Negotiation. Thank you all so much for rejoining us again. We've got Al Muniz here, and we're going to transition into a question and answer session with Al. Over the break, we've been collecting several of your questions from viewers, and we've received a number of great questions that Al is here to answer for us. Before we move into those questions, though, I'd like to remind you all, all of the materials from today's presentation, including the slides, will be posted in the upcoming weeks on FAI.gov. So you can check the FAI.gov out to uh, access those slides and uh, view this seminar again if you'd like. So let's go ahead and uh, transition to our first question from a viewer. Al, someone has submitted this question. They said, when you say don't buy from strangers, doesn't this lead to buying repeatedly from the incumbent? How do new sources get in the door, especially small businesses? Um, well, we got a lot of questions about the incumbents and, and um, uh, you know, what the uh, what vendor engagement means for kind of this incumbency? I, th I think there's a lot of uh, misperceptions about uh, the number of incumbents that do get in the door, and of course there are a lot of questions from industry whenever they see the incumbent get a, a follow-on contract for the same or very similar work. Um, no, uh, not buying from strangers doesn't mean uh, buying repeatedly from the incumbent. 
Um, actually, I would say exactly the opposite is probably more the concern when you see the incumbent getting in the door that perhaps the contracting staff or the agency that's, that's doing the buying um, is not getting enough market research and is not really um, looking at what else is available in the market, not really looking at you know, what the level of competition probably should be for that particular procurement. Um, and that leads to the incumbent coming back in and you know, getting another um, shot at, at exactly the same work again. Um, so I would say by not understanding the market, not understanding the incumbent, um, the other businesses that are competing with the incumbent, uh, leads more toward the incumbent coming in and getting repeat work than not. Um, as for new sources getting in the door, um, especially for small businesses, you know, of course there is the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization at every agency. Um, there are um, the, the advanced acquisition plans that are, are po uh, published out there that are available for vendors that are interested in doing work with the agency. Um, new sources getting in the door, you know, uh, as far as that goes, it's really a matter of looking at the market, seeing who's available, um, seeing, you know, taking a look at your solicitation, seeing if they're even competing for the work. Um, anything that happens where you're not getting enough competition or you're seeing the incumbent come back to the table time and time again and, and get repeated work, um, mm. there's, there's some sort of problem there. If there's something that uh, perhaps is a barrier to entry for that particular contract uh, or a solicitation or if perhaps it's worded in such a way that it's not drawing competition, um, those, I would say, where you should go for that information is directly out to industry and ask them, why aren't you competing on our work? What is it about our solicitation that's creating barriers for you to competing on our work? Uh, and have that conversation there. Get that information back from the vendor community to see what it is that you can do uh, with your solicitation, perhaps, um, or, or you know, a, a number of other uh, things. Perhaps it's just uh, some of your requirement is a little bit too... Um, uh, strongly worded or it's, um, it's not allowing for new innovations to be brought to bear. Um, so something in there can be changed that would allow those vendors to uh, then submit uh, responses to your solicitation and compete for the work. Great. Another question that was submitted about this idea of not buying from strangers our viewer has asked, I fully recognize the value and need to do market research, but when we have to publicly post or synopsize most procurements and any source can submit a proposal, how do you not buy from strangers? Uh, another good question. So a, a couple of things going on there. Um, uh, how do you not buy from strangers when you're putting something new out also? Um, when you don't have a, an existing contract for that or you're buying something that needs to be developed? Um, well, find out, uh, again, uh, look at FAR Part 10, look at the type of market research that you can do to find more about uh, the industry and the sources that are available in the market in which you wish to do business. Um, getting to know those vendors, getting to know that vendor pool, getting to know what the competition is like, is it small businesses mostly, is it large businesses that you're going to be expecting, where are they located in the country or, or on the planet for that matter. Um, all of those things are going to make a difference in the type of responses that you can expect, and they can also make a difference in the type of solicitation that you write, um, the type of va uh, vendor engagement activities that you should engage in, um, and how you can uh, increase the amount of competition, increase opportunities for small business, and allow for innovations to be brought to bear. Um, mm -hmm. Getting to know that market, um, commensurate with the level of complexity, the dollar value, uh, and the type of work you're doing, that's going to keep you from buying from strangers. Great. Okay, well, someone else has asked, are you saying we should not seek new vendors to distribute business around equally? Are we supposed to just use the vendors we've been using for years? Okay, and another question uh, related to incumbents. Um, no, I'm not saying that you should not seek new vendors. In fact, um, I don't think that um, despite the fact that you've had a vendor in working an incumbent for a while, that you should know that vendor it, it, on any great level more than you know the vendor pool. I would say that you need to equalize that a little bit uh, and find out what other vendors are available to compete for that work that, that might be submitting, submitting responses to your solicitations, um, that might be interested in doing the work, maybe they have some innovations, maybe they have some uh, news about the industry um, that's changing. Um, it, so that they can come in and compete for the work and, and maybe provide a better solution than the one that you were anticipating at the time that the solicitation was written. Um, 
uh, definitely you want to seek those new vendors out. You want to do your vendor engagement, your industry days, um, your small business conferences, where, wherever you have an opportunity to reach out and touch the vendor community, um, go out and talk to those vendors, find out, you know, like we were saying on an earlier question, if there are any problems for them, if there are any barriers to entry, uh, if there are any uh, prohibitions that they see on competing for the work because of, and there's all variety of things that might, uh, might cause that. Um, and again, no, uh, don't, don't continue to use the vendors you've been using for years or, or don't necessarily exclude them, but at the same time, don't think that that's the way to go is to every single time award a contract uh, to a vendor that you're familiar with. Um, the door is open at solicitation time to any vendor that's able to provide that solution to the government and all sources should be considered. Um, if, if there are things in the market that lead you down one path or another path as far as business size or um, you know, the type of industry, um, those are the things that you should consider when you put the solicitation together. Those are the things that you should be asking industry about um, when it comes time to putting your solicitation together to doing your market research. Um, they're going to be the ones that have the information that you're going to need in order to put the best possible requirement out there for them to compete on so you get the most competition so that you allow for innovation uh, and that you uh, reduce any barriers that vendors might be having uh, to responding to the solicitations that you're putting out there. Great. That is some great information. So their question is, if you are the core on a task order or contract, what is and is not permissible when engaging with vendors or contractors? Okay, and the answer to this question, like so many questions about acquisition, is it depends. Um, and it depends on a, a number of things that you'll be able to see as you're going through the process. If, for example, you don't have a solicitation yet, if you're just doing market research to find out what's available, pretty much anybody can, can communicate with vendors. Um, and it, in all manner of different ways, uh, it just it, talking to vendors one-on-one, -on -one, um, having industry days, going to industry events, um, all of those things are permissible at that time. You can have a conversation uh, so long as you don't cross the line and start talking about um, your upcoming procurements and your proposed plans to, uh, to solicit. Uh, those, are, those have some restrictions in the FAR and agencies, again, it depends on your agency. Um, agencies have their own... Um, uh, written rules about when you can and cannot engage with uh, vendors and what you can and cannot say. So I would say what you want to do in that situation, find out, take a look at the FAR, see what it says about market research, see what it says about talking in the pre-solicitation phase, uh, and have a conversation with your contracting shop about what is and is not permissible and, and have a real conversation with them. Um, some contracting officers are going to tend to say, no, you can't talk to anyone at any time, and that's just, that's just not true, not at any agency. Um, so that have that conversation with them, find out what is and is not permissible, get a good sense of where the comfort level is for your particular type of work, and then get out there and, and, and do some engagement. Um, now the things change when the solicitation gets issued. At that point, all communication should go through the contracting officer, and any communication on an ongoing solicitation should stop at, at receipt of proposals. Be careful also that uh, if you do get into that phase where you're starting to uh, make adjustments to your solicitation uh, based on the types of questions that you're getting from vendors, that that information is shared uh, as is required by FAR 15 with all vendors that are, are possibly going to be uh, responding to your solicitation. The next question is also related to core duties, so we'll go ahead and go to, go to that one. A viewer has asked, how do cores encourage innovative, efficient, and effective performance by federal contractors without the authority to provide financial incentives or quick and immediate sticks? Um, one of the things that th this question brings up is uh, one, of the, one of the overlooked parts of the, of the engagement uh, in the acquisition process. I think we're seeing more... Um, discussion about it now, it, it, it seems to have been um, uh, neglected perhaps a little bit in the past, uh, and that has to do with the uh, performance evaluation of a vendor at the conclusion of their contract. Um, one of the things for communication with your vendor is to have that um, permanent record for them so they can look at how they were rated on the performance on the particular contract and so the next uh, contracting shop that has a chance to look at that vendor for a proposed uh, contract uh, can have some information about how that vendor has performed in the past uh, and have that open conversation. So it's, it's twofold. It, um, it 
has the conversation between the agency and the existing vendor, but it also for the next uh, agency that has to do business with that vendor or, is, or potentially doing business with that vendor, gives them an idea of how that vendor is doing. Now the vendor community knows that these things are out there. They know that the, these are generated, they go down to the next agency, they want to do a good job, they want a good per, uh, performance evaluation because it means the next contract for them. If they uh, are in line for a future contract and their performance has been poor, uh, the performance evaluation has been poor, they know that their chances of getting that next contract are, are, have also been decreased. Uh, so they're going to want to do a good job. So I would say uh, to incentivize them um, it, within your existing structure, there are, there are some other ways to do it within your contract. You're probably familiar with in incentive contracting or award fees or other ways that you can incentivize performance, uh, cost savings. Those are all permissible um, methods in the FAR. Uh, but one way that you can apply to absolutely every type of contract that you do uh, is to have that conversation up front with your vendor saying, here's your performance evaluation, here's what we're going to be rating you on, uh, have that conversation during performance. Uh, and then at the end, uh, have that dialogue, have that uh, open dialogue with the vendor, that honest communication back and forth about how the performance went, uh, and formalize that and get that into the system so the next contracting office down can see uh, how they performed on that contract. And that's going to improve uh, quality outcomes for everybody down the road. I think that's some great advice and good suggestions for all the cores out there. Uh, the next question is about statement of work that we'd like to get into. And a viewer has asked, at what point can you circulate or advertise a draft statement of work to industry partners, and how should this be done? Uh, okay, so the answer to this question is, is another it depends, and it depends on your agency's uh, internal guidance and um, the, the way that they've structured handling draft scopes of work. Now, some agencies d have more... Um, information about when to circulate a draft scope of work. Some have less. Um, but you see all kinds of innovative things going out there right now with draft statements of work. Um, a GSA, for example, uh, has been posting uh, their draft solicitations uh, up on a wiki and allowing vendors to come back and um, provide comments uh, that, that everyone can see. Um, other agencies are doing similar things with their draft statements of work. Um, going out to industry, they're having industry days. Um, some agencies are even doing uh, uh, industry days for the purpose of market research. So they're going out with a, a, a really draft document um, where they're, they're really not sure, you know, they, they know what, what requirement they need to fill, but they're really not even sure what things are available to even um, to meet that requirement from the vendor community or even if it exists. So they're going out with a really draft document. Um, and getting back some information on what's available, you know, what they can expect at that point uh, in terms of competition. Um, so they're doing some really innovative things. So there are, there are different rules in different agencies, I'm going to say, um, but getting that information out there, even if it's not a draft scope of work, if it's something that's, that's even less than that, um, if it's just an idea of something and you're just going out to do market research, um, all of that uh, prior to solicitation, prior to when that um, document has been formalized and you're ready to go out with a solicitation, uh, those, types of, those types of things are permissible. Again, I would advise you, uh, if you have a document that's formal, if it's something that you're planning to procure, make sure with your contracting officer uh, that you're not violating the rules when it comes to uh, giving out pre-solicitation information. These are all great questions that our viewers are submitting. Please continue to submit your questions. Uh, we are collecting them as we speak. Uh, the next question we have asks, how can vendors get information ab about future procurements and what can they be told? Okay, so this is a great question if you're just getting into the whole vendor engagement thing. Um, vendors get information from a variety of sources. Um, your advanced acquisition uh, planning documents uh, are something that are generally public documents generated in each agency, uh, something that the, uh, your OSTABU, your Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization, uh, is going to keep and share with vendors uh, throughout the year at vendor uh, engagement at small business conferences that they attend. Um, that type of information is always available for vendors. It's, it's information that's not protected. It's very, very... Um, rough, I'm going to say. There's not a lot of uh, meat into, this, into the scope of work, but it gives an idea for vendors uh, about what solicitations they can expect from the agency or potentially expect from the agency during the next year. Um, other vendors 
uh, have found that they can go back even a step before that and take a look at appropriations language that gets passed every year um, that shows you know what programs are going to be funded. If they're working in those industries, they'll know that if a program is getting funded, uh, that's something that you know some potential solicitations are going to be coming out of. So that gives them some additional information early on. And again, when you go out and you start doing your industry days around a particular solicitation, that's going to give them more information. Um, draft RFPs. There, there are a number of, uh, of other documents that can go out, RFIs, uh, that will give information to vendors about what it is that you're going to be soliciting. Um, again, uh, some more formal than others, but always with the uh, intent of getting information from industry about your solicitation or your potential solicitations uh, so that you can craft a better uh, document so that you increase your competition and your um, use of small businesses. The next question that's come in is about multiple vendors. And our viewer has asked, if multiple vendors have similar products or services, how many vendors need to be engaged? Okay, and, and again, uh, unfortunately, as so many things in acquisition are, uh, the answer is it depends. Um, I don't think there's a, a specific number that can be given for any particular solicitation. Uh, of course, scale uh, your efforts with the level of complexity, uh, the dollar value, uh, the type of uh, industry that you're working in. If you're, if you're working in a very fast industry, if things are changing all the time, you'll probably need to expand your efforts. Um, if you're working in something that uh, isn't quite so, so fast moving, you probably don't need to have that much uh, engagement with industry for everybody on the government side to understand what's available, uh, what's upcoming, uh, any innovations, any disruptions that are going on out there that will cause you to maybe alter course a little bit with your solicitation. Um, but uh, you want to go out, you know, again, at a level commensurate with the type of thing that you're buying. So in some cases that answer is going to be zero. In some cases it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to do a lot of engagement. You have to do a lot of market research in order to make sure uh, that you're getting the best bargain possible for your agency. Great. And someone else would like to know uh, if they should read the Mythbusters memo to get guidance related to communication with contractors. Is that something you would recommend? Uh, actually, it is. The, uh, the memos themselves are both posted on the uh, OMB website, uh, the White House website. You can probably just Google uh, Mythbusters, uh, Mythbusters memos, OMB Mythbusters memos, and you'll find both of the documents there. Now, these memos, when they came out, they were directed to the agency. So they were kind of directed to the agency heads, the, the CAOs, the chief acquisition officers, and the senior procurement executives in the agencies, uh, who then turned around and created specific guidance for that agency. So some of them passed it along uh, whole. They passed both memos along to all of their acquisition staff. Some of them uh, attached memos to them. Some of them wrote their own memos and maybe just had a link to those memos. Um, but I would say you definitely want to read those uh, memos. You, you want to uh, absorb the information that's in there. Both of those documents are, are filled with uh, information. They're filled with FAR citations. Uh, they're a good document to have with you if you're going to your contracting officer for the first time uh, to talk about vendor engagement. Uh, for the vendor community, they're good documents to bring into the agency to, to have a discussion about vendor engagement. Uh, I would say that anyone involved in the process on either side uh, and from any level uh, would benefit from taking a look at those documents and understanding both the misconceptions and their answers um, that are uh, written out in the Mythbusters memos. Great. Another viewer has a concern about a conflict of interest and they said, doesn't engaging vendors constitute a conflict of interest? Um, and the answer there is going to be uh, yes and no. Uh, no uh, in particular because just engaging with a vendor and having a conversation about the possible um, is not a conflict of interest. Now there are some things that you have to be careful of. Now I'll refer you to the FAR and to your contracting officer to talk about what uh, organizational conflicts of interest are out there. Uh, perhaps even have a conversation with counsel uh, if that's something that looks like it. It might be a possibility depending on the questions that you have to ask. Uh, but no, uh, FAR Part 10 and FAR 15 are very clear about um, the need to go out and, and have and the encouragement to have those conversations with vendors um, to, to do market research, to find out you know, what is possible in response to your solicitation, to find out what business sizes are available, 
um, and, and to see how you can best structure your solicitation in order to get the maximum response. Great. We've got some more time and uh, viewers just keep on sending in some questions. So let's go ahead and answer another one. Al, you might need to help me with the uh, pronunciation of this next one. Our uh, viewer has asked, what is meant by commoditized? Well, commoditization occurs when uh, products or services in the industry have become so alike uh, from one vendor to another uh, that competition is really reduced to simply price. So if you think about something that you buy commonly in your life, maybe it's pens or pencils or something, the, those are really good examples of something that's been commoditized. Uh, if you're looking to buy a pen, uh, one pen does pretty much what another pen does. Um, you should probably buy the one that costs a dime rather than the one that costs maybe $10. Um, there's, there, for what they do, for what a pen does, it's a simple thing to compare them. Uh, blue versus black ink perhaps uh, is a separate discussion, but the, the term commoditized simply means that the products or services have become so similar that really the only difference between them is price. Now on the services side, uh, there's some commoditization occurring on things such as you know perhaps janitorial services or um, even cable services or utilities. Um, those things have become commoditized. They're, they're so alike from one vendor to another that there really is no distinction between them except for price. And when something does become commoditized, of course, the recommendation that I'll always make to my buyers is just buy the cheapest one. All right, great. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation, uh, know more about the vendor. And one of our viewers would like a little clarity around that. Um, they would like to know, do you mean the manufacturer of the product or the actual vendor selling the product, like a reseller? Uh, another excellent question. Um, so I guess it would, the first question I would ask you in return is, well, which one are you going to be buying from? Um, and if you're going to be buying from a reseller, is that reseller going to be able to give you enough information about the product that you're buying, about maintenance costs, about warranty, um, that you don't need to further engage with the manufacturer to find out some of the specifics. Now, some of the more technical things that get purchased out there, um, the, really the, the uh, manufacturer is going to be the only source of information for kind of the specifics, the details of how it was put together, uh, what it's made out of, is it sustainable, um, is the supply chain transparent, for example, that a reseller is not going to be able to answer? In a lot of cases, there are no resellers for a product. Really, all you have is manufacturers. And in other cases, all you have is resellers. There are very few manufacturers that you can tap into um, that will sell directly. Um, so it's going to depend on what you're buying, and your market research is going to tell you uh, whether or not you should be engaging with, your, with vendors, with resellers, or whether you should be engaging directly with manufacturers. And I'll tell you this, in my experience, it's been a surprise at times uh, to find out the difference in the, the quality and the level of information that you get from a manufacturer and then you get from a reseller. A reseller has certain information, but a reseller's business is really to resell. Uh, it's not to develop something. It's not to uh, build something. That's really the manufacturer's job. So when it comes to getting the specifics of how something was built, uh, where the materials are come from, uh, how sustainable they are, how green they are, uh, the manufacturer is going to be the best source of information for that. Okay. We have another question submitted about statement of work and this viewer says if I'm getting ready to do a recompete of my current contract can I get input for the next statement of work from the incumbent? Uh, and the answer to that is uh, again it depends um, what type of information that you're trying to get from the incumbent um, of course, uh, there are some prohibitions that you'll find in the FAR regarding uh, organizational conflicts of interest and having a vendor prepare your, um, your scope of work. Um, there, are some, there are some hard stops there. If uh, a vendor participates in generating a scope of work, they can cross the line to where they're not going to be able to compete um, or um, where uh, they've crossed the line into an organizational conflict of interest, which would also bar them from competing for the resultant uh, solicitation. Um, so I, I would say those by themselves, though, don't stop you from getting information from your incumbent, uh, especially information that's not particular to that uh, solicitation to, uh, to the requirement, uh, information about the market, information about innovations, information about technology. Um, those types of things you're going to be going to your vendor pool uh, to get information on anyways, and your, your incumbent, just 
by fact of them being the incumbent doesn't exclude them from that pool. So I would say uh, you, you do want to get information from your incumbent as part of that larger vendor community. Uh, just make sure you don't cross the line and uh, lead your vendor into the organizational conflict of interest or uh, generating the solicitation in such a way that's going to preclude them from competing for the work later on. All right, we've had a lot of uh, vendor engagement questions, and we've got a negotiations question that we can move on to. Uh, a viewer has asked, should the government have a legal representative on his or her negotiations team? Um, so, again, this is going to depend. Um, I have worked in agencies where that was uh, a little bit far-fetched just because there, there simply wasn't enough counsel to go around. Um, the, the topics that came up in negotiation were business topics, they weren't really legal topics, um, they weren't something that counsel uh, was necessarily needed for in that particular situation. Um, and then there have, have been some other situations that I've been in where legal counsel was present on both sides uh, and the discussion, you know, went down the road of kind of the legal implications of what was being discussed and what, what the legal path forward was going to be. Um, so it's going to depend on your situation. I would say you probably don't want to have legal representatives at every single negotiation, uh, but that it's a possibility depending on what it is that you're going to be getting into. Uh, and again, that, that conversation should be had with your contracting officer. And if the contracting officer can't answer those questions, um, then I'm sure they're going to be calling counsel and they're going to be asking, hey, should we have counsel present? Um, look to the FAR, look to your agency guidance, and of course talk to the contracting officer and decide together whether you think it's going to be a good idea or to even ask the question of whether or not you should have counsel at your negotiating table. All right. Another negotiations question that we would like to get to. Should GSA and other agency schedule pricing be negotiated, even though it is considered fair and reasonable? How do you negotiate those prices further down? Okay, so the, the answer to the first question is yes, absolutely. Um, even though those, that schedule pricing is out there, um, it's probably not, in a lot of cases, the best price that you, that you can possibly get. In some cases it might be, uh, but for the most part, uh, it, you, it's going to be extraordinarily valuable for you if you at least ask the question if you can get a better price. Um, I would say you should not exclude schedule pricing from the further negotiation. I, absolutely not. You should always ask the question um, whether or not you can get a better price. Perhaps there are some bulk or volume discounts that you can achieve by going over certain thresholds. Um, have that conversation with the vendors at that time. Seek discounts whenever you're doing uh, schedule uh, buying. Um, don't uh, discount uh, the ability to negotiate a better price just because it's a scheduled pricing. Um, and then for how to negotiate those prices further down, well, you're going to have to take a look and see again uh, what, the, uh, what the market conditions are, what type of product or service that you're buying. Um, in some cases, there probably aren't opportunities for lower prices or perhaps not as great opportunities. Maybe you can get a, a slight discount. Um, but have those conversations with the vendor uh, and you know, talk to the negotiation team, do your market research, be prepared for when you talk to the vendor and n have a good idea of where it is that you want to go. Uh, something that I, I think a lot of people go into negotiations with when it comes to schedules uh, without thinking about it is really we just want to get a lower price. Well, that's a, that's a good goal. You know, agencies all need to save money. They're, they're all going to be very, very happy if you get a better price. Uh, but where are you going? Um, at the end of the day, you still have to end up with a fair and reasonable price. And if that schedule price isn't fair and reasonable, or you can get a better price that's fair and reasonable, that's where you want to head. Um, so I would say you do want to negotiate, you do want to try and get better pricing when it comes to schedule uh, contracting, uh, but at the same time, understand where you're going, understand you know the possible, understand uh, how far that price can go down before it's just unsustainable on the part of the vendor. Great, I think this is a good follow-up question to that. Uh, our, our viewer has said, my budget is what my budget is. How can I negotiate if the vendor cannot operate within my budget constraints? Is that the time to go back and reevaluate the statement of work? Uh, this question comes up frequently also when we talk about vendor engagement and negotiation. Um, perhaps uh, it's time to go back and reevaluate the scope of work. Um, maybe the scope of work itself um, has is written in such a way that it can be pared down to, to meet your budget. Um, 
your part of your requirement is the budget. So you may have on your mind that you're going out to buy whatever the widget is that you're going to buy or whatever the service is, but if you don't have the money for that, well, it's, it's just not realistic to stick to that. Um, so maybe an alternative is in order. Uh, maybe increased competition is in order. There are, there are some things that you can do to maneuver um, around what your requirement is so that you can you know, meet your budget constraints. I would say that your, your budget is, is not your negotiation position, although I've seen that mistake made many times as well. Um, you've got a finite amount of funding, you need to meet whatever the requirement is, and everything else goes by the wayside. Quality, sustainability, green, um, sustainability, uh, maintenance costs down the road, everything went out the window in order to get that purchase made for whatever it is, and six months later you've got a purchase that you've made for something that you can no longer use. Um, that's, that might be an extreme case, but it absolutely does happen. I've seen it happen several times. Um, so the budget shouldn't be the overriding concern, um, but it, it is absolutely going to constrain what it is that you can purchase, and you should plan accordingly for that in your requirement. Great. I think we have time for one last question. And one of our viewers has asked, aren't vendors uh, bonded against failure to perform at an agreed to price? Um, and again, this is another one of those questions where the answer is it depends. Um, and it depends on the type of contract and it depends on the type of vendor. Uh, and I would refer you again to the FAR with regard to bonding. Uh, construction contracts, for example, have different bonding requirements than service contracts. Um, and it, those contracts themselves have different uh, bonding requirements based on the type of contract, uh, the type of vendor that you're going to be getting. Um, so you need to take a look at those. Uh, the answer is yes, there are some performance bonds uh, in, in the contracting. There are some possibilities for uh, putting performance bonds in places where um, they aren't normally required in the FAR, uh, but to navigate that um, uh, path to, to figure that out, you're going to have to take a look at the FAR uh, and take a look at your risk. Uh, remember that anytime you ask a vendor for something over and above what they're normally um, providing uh, by way of bonding or anything else, warranty, level of quality, sustainability, green, whatever, remember that when you bake those things into your solicitation, uh, over a product that normally doesn't have those, you're going to have to expect to pay more for them. Um, so bonds are a good backstop against failure to perform in a lot of cases. They're not called for in absolutely every situation. Uh, and remember that when you do include them in those situations that you're going to have to expect to pay more for them. <clears throat> Great. Well, Al, we want to thank you so much for this very informative presentation and all of these great questions that our viewers have submitted. Uh, to all of our viewers out there, we want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, we hope you found this presentation useful. We hope you can apply the information that Al has shared with you in your next vendor engagements and negotiations. If you have additional questions that we were not able to address today, uh, please feel free to continue to submit them. Again, all of the materials will be posted on FAI.gov, and we'll do our best to, uh, to post uh, some of your questions with some answers provided on FAI.gov in the upcoming weeks as well. Again, we want to thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for the uh, for word for of the next acquisition lear learning seminar presented by the Federal Acquisition Institute. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.